Спасибо, Крис. Есть вопросы? Олеся? Спасибо большое. Мне спрашивают по-английски или по-русски? Можно по-русски, по-английски. Как ты хочешь? Frankly speaking, I am not sure I understood your um, idea about forest and its copulas, because to the best of my knowledge, the difference between ng and e in forest and its is um, it's a um, complementary distribution, like a suppletive stem. So you said that Jan Hunin suggested it for as a diachronic analysis, uh, but synchronically the situation is not the same. So I don't understand what you mean here because I think it is the same synchronically. There are cells in the paradigm when it is now, uh, like our uh, negation, well, several cells, if you want, I can, I can check them. Uh, and then the other cells when it is air, and it doesn't matter whether this is locative or any other type of um, nominal predication. So that's why I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Yeah, but basically, I, uh, I think we uh, completely, completely mean the same. So um, that it is complementary, um, complementary distribution in forest ends. And so, what I was um, trying to do here is um, to maybe put this into the scheme which was proposed with this nominal and locational strategy and. Um, it might well be that this that this scheme or this um, approach towards um, the typology of locative predication is not the best one, but basically I think we may mean exactly the, the, the same, that there is synchronically this functional division between these two. May they be subtitive stems or may they be two semantic items or whatsoever, so, but in function definitely there's complementary distribution. Yeah, but just want to stress that this distribution between a and e is not restricted by locative clauses. I mean, it is the same in all contexts where you need the verb to be. Um, so that's why it's, for me, it's not a part of a typology of locative predication, but uh, the way how the verb to be works in this language generally also beyond uh, locative predication. And then the other comment was that you said that Nangana Sana has a positive, uh, uses a positive existential verb uh, in locative predication, but uh, forest tenants and tundra tenants have the same related verb, which they also use, uh, like tonne, but you didn't mention it. Yeah, okay. Um, once more about the um, na and e stuff, then maybe I was then maybe I just made the mistake there. And if it is like you say, then I definitely have to, yeah, somehow reformulate or just have another look about it, mm -hmm. uh, about Tonne. Um, but does it really occur in locked clauses where we have the um, theme as definite and topical um, referent or only the other way around in existential constructions? Where we have in the tent, there is a dog, I mean, in these constructions, clearly, but but also the other way around, if we say the dog is in the tent. Yeah, I think you can say it. Uh, well, I'm pretty. Yeah, I listen, now, okay. Um, I think you can use it, the dog is in the tent. And the immediate example I see in our paper is uh, near, um, near Dixon, there is Shaitanka. Like this is a text example that I just um, see immediately that near something, near some village, there is another um, village or something. And they use Tone in this sense, and I think you can say there is a dog in the tent, but you can easily check it in the corpus actually. Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. I would 
check again. Yeah, but yeah, sure. Thanks. And Nicolette? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I have three small comments and additional information if you are interested in regarding Tondrañanya's data. But first of all, can I can we back get back to the fourth slide? Uh, which is about the, the standard definition, and I, I know that you, you use the definitions, but I wanted just to add to this part, to this location that might be definite or indefinite, but if you take that the locative element is part of the predicate, that you can only assume that it is definite, because if it's the part of the, of the uh, predicate, that, then the bare noun is always definite, so it cannot be indefinite. So maybe it's something that can be useful for your further test or something, this small <laughs> comment. And uh, there is also some information uh, on the 11th slide in Tundrenyanyas, I think that, yes, so this pattern, almost the same pattern can be found also in, in Tundrenyanyas. The rest yes. of the verb. Mm -hmm. So maybe this can help you to add to the to yes, sure. mm -hmm. And I can send you data because we have tested it. So there is a, a, a verb which is key in Yanyas and it takes the whole verbal morphology and behaves the same that, than this there in Ganakan. So maybe, yeah, it can be additional data to your to your research. And also in the 13th slide, so a similar strategy is also available in, in Tundrenyanyas, this locational existential. So the existential verb also can have a, a definite uh, subject, which is really interesting because okay. <laughs> the existential mm -hmm. construction is per definition and uh, has, has a, or has a, an indefinite subject. But yes, the same structure can be found in mm -hmm. the So some okay. additional things. Yeah, yeah, thank you for this discussion. Mm -hmm. Because um, as, as for Nen, it's, it's, it's always kind of problematic to find authentic data, but since there are no, no, no big corporates on and so forth. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. That's right. I kind, kind, kind of to always add. difficult to rely there on, on grammars or dictionaries or whatsoever. But yeah, thank you. So I will send you data uh, if you are interested in so or so, but yeah. So thank you for the talk. Спасибо, Николай. Спасибо, Крис. Нам уже не хватает времени на вопросы. Тогда мы перейдем к следующему докладу от Йозефины. Будешь? Она форик Дэвисис и Салкоп. Yes, I'll try to share my screen. Ты помнишь, бюджет фрагмент? Yes. Um, it should have worked. I also mm -hmm. do this in English and I, yes, um, I'll talk about anaphoric devices in cell group. Um, as anaphora is a term that is sometimes used differently in different linguistic theories. I very shortly just say that I, when I talk about anaphora, I mean the reference to a previously mentioned referent. Um, that can happen in the same form, so just the repetition of the um, referent again, or in a pro form, or in a somewhat modified form. So this would usually be the place where in article languages the definite article would play a role. So if you have some introduction of a referent, there's a horse in the stable, and then when referring back to it in English or in German, we would have the horse, or if you use a pro form, it. Um, so um, the anaphora is per definition definite. It's very prototypical form of that. Um, and I took a look at this occurrences in um, cell group with the help of two corpora or the compilation of two corporas. Um, I think most of you already know these corpora if they, as they have been mentioned in the last couple of days and there are quite some people here that worked with them or helped build them. So I used the enol corpus um, and the SLC corpus, the psychoblanguage language corpus. Both of them are available, available online and I'll have the links later on my slides. Um, 
both of them are mostly folklore and narratives, but we also have some translations and songs, and most of the texts are from the 60s and 70s. Um, the inner corpus is um, the field notes of Kusmina, and the Serkub language corpus focused on publishing already, or making already published text dig digitally available. Um, yes, so that's my data. I also have the amount of data I used for this study. By now, both corpora are already a bit bigger. So if you have a look at them now, you have already more data, which is pretty amazing. Um, I am also, um, my study focused on all dialect groups of Salkup. So I took North, Central, South into account. There are also some mixed sources, but they are not that relevant by right now. So I had like a total of 77,000, a bit more tokens. That's quite a lot for Salkup. And then I took a look at it. Um, the data is annotated, among other things, for syntactic functions, semantic roles, and quite important for me for this topic, information status. Um, that was a big help. Um, the information status is uh, annotated for new, accessible, and given with some subcategories in the accessible thing, but yeah, that's not that interesting for me. For me, obviously, the given category is quite important when looking at anaphora because it's precisely what I'm looking at. It marks a referent, uh, or it marks that a referent has already been mentioned before, so it's what I what I need. And also quite helpful is that given is further subdivided into given active and given inactive. Um, given active here refers to um, a referent which has been mentioned in the same or in the previous sentence, and inactive is a referent that has been mentioned further away. That will also play a role in what I took a look at. So yeah, that's my data and my basic idea what I wanted to look at. Um, when looking at anaphoric reference or the research on it in CellCoop, we mostly find mentioning of it in the description of the possessive suffixes, especially in the description of the non-possessive use of the possessive suffix. So um, and looking at various um, sources, there's always the mention that, yes, it can be used in a forical as well. Um, so I took a look at that, if that's true. And I also want to say that even though I try to give some tendencies and some kind of rules when to choose what kind of expression. It is not entirely predictable on uh, how a speaker decides on what anaphoric expression to use. So that's important to keep in mind that I basically just can talk about tendencies, not very strict rules. Um, the questions I try to answer is which type of definite nominal phrase is used for anaphoric references. I said earlier that um, in ethical languages, the definite article plays a quite some role, but as we all know, circuit doesn't exhibit one. Um, so the question is what types of definite nominal phrases are used then? At what fre frequency are, uh, are they used? Which factors influence the choice? And um, as I said, what role does the possessive suffix in its non-possessive function play for that? Um, to get a first impression, I took my corpora or the compilation of the two corpora and uh, did a very basic, well, it was not that basic, ah, the chat, uh, a very basic, just, I just counted what's actually happening. So I counted uh, different types of definite nominal phrases and looked at the number they quote in. I won't go into detail about all of them. I will focus on the interplay of these six. So I will look at proper names, personal pronouns, zero anaphora, demonstrative, and the possessive uh, suffix in its non-possessive function. It's a very long term repeat. Um, yes. Uh, um, these six types they have they interact with with each other in a quite clear way some of this is also not very surprising but i think it's still interesting to know that also for cell group that it behaves in that way so if you have like a sentence um here uh, i think it's a woman this person goes uh by flower we have first the first mentioning with a personal pronoun and then when she repeats 
uh, more verbs, she does not need to repeat um, the, the pronoun or some other you know, uh, reference back to it. So we just have like zero anaphora or just a verbal element referring back to it. Um, that's pretty straightforward. We know that from some other uh, erratic languages as well. That's a pro drop language. We don't need the uh, uh, subject uh, expressed. So this is like the interplay of personal pronouns and zero, zero anaphora, the same basically holds true for proper names and zero anaphora or also proper names and um, personal pronouns. Uh, we have Itya who goes fishing and hunting. So Itya is introduced with its proper name and when then referred back to him, um, we have the zero anaphora again or just the verbal element here. Um, that we're still talking about the same person that Itya is still doing it. Um, yeah, that's basically when referring back to persons like humans, we have proper names, personal pronouns, and the zero anaphora. When talking about animals or objects, Salkoop uses um, not a personal pronoun in a form, but a demonstrative pronoun here, the anaphoric demonstrative na, so if we talk about a snake, which is in introduced in the example 3a, um, and then refer back to the snake in its pro form, then it would be na in, in this form. So the demonstrative pronoun and the personal pronoun basically fulfill the same function, but for different types of reference. But if the demonstrative is not used pronominal, um, but um, in a determinative function, then it works a bit differently. Um, in example four here, we have um, the person marked with the demonstrative, uh, with the anaphoric demonstrative. So we, it is, the idea is to reactivate um, the referent. In this kind of text, um, Itya talks about this man with his grandmother. He has never met this man. The man did not actively play any role in this text, but now he goes to see this person. So it's reactivated in the hearer's mind that he should be able to know who this is. So one function of the demonstrative here is, as I said, to reactivate a referent um, that has been mentioned quite a while ago. Or the second function is to establish uh, just and a referent that had just been mentioned as a topic. Um, here in example 7a, um, they tell us that there are three tents standing on the river shore. Oh, this is also interesting for Chris. We have to stand up here for the sit. Um, and then in the next uh, sentence, uh, b, these tents are now the topic of the sentence and therefore the demonstrative is used to mark them as topical. So these are the two functions of the demonstrative determiner in, in cell group in uh, anaphoric reference tracking. So we have these types of um, possibilities to mark anaphoric reference. And then obviously the question is when to use what? And there, a cell group is quite logical on a, also on a topological point of view that the lower accessible a referent is, the higher it has to be marked. And so proper names are usually considered very highly marked. Demonstrative are a bit less marked and zero anaphora is unmarked. So to use zero anaphora, the referent has to be very highly accessible in the speaker's mind or memory. Um, there are some factors um, in play here to determine how accessible a referent is. One of them is, for instance, distance, which is quite nice because that can be checked very easily in our corpora because we have this distinction with, between inactive and active. Um, and if you look at uh, the expression, of given reference in regarding to the activation, we can see that if we have an active referent, proper names are very seldomly used, while zero anaphora is very highly used. And for inactive reference, it's the opposite way, which is very good for us because it fits in our theory that proper names are 
um, used for inactive reference that are further away mentioned that need to be reactivated. We can also see from the numbers that demonstrative determinants don't really fit into the picture, but that's quite clear from what, uh, what I just said, that they have these two functions that they can either reactivate or um, make an active referent topical. So they do not fit in this distance scheme, but other factors that I won't go into detail here um, can be accounted then for them. So we have quite clear idea on when to use these or how these four types can be distinguished. And then obviously the question for us is uh, what happens with the possessive suffix in, in its non-possessive function, how is that used? And um, when looking at the examples I found in our corpora, it's quite clear that the non-possessive uh, use of the possessive suffix of in cell group only the third person singular is um, basically the same as for the demonstrative. So we either have, as here an example, eight a reactivation in this text, um, this 12 headed snake or dragon has been mentioned before. It has been the underlying topic of this whole adventure story, but it has never really been present or active in a way. But now this hero killed this 12 headed snake. And so we can say I killed this uh, 12 headed snake that we already know about, but he does not use a uh, demonstrative, but uh, possessive suffix that can't be interpreted at possessive here. Um, and in example nine, we have this um, topicalization of a just introduced referent where the mice, um, they surround it here, they now all disappear. So we just, the mice has, have been mentioned in the sentence before, and now they are the topic of the sentence. Um, so we can see that these functions are the same and this holds, holds true for all the examples I found. And especially interesting is then that they are quite often used together. I think that's the same in NADS and other languages. So we quite often have the possessive suffix and a non-possessive function and the demonstrative together. Um, sort of a double marking. Yeah, here we have the gypsy and here we have the devils um, to whom she, the, the speaker lives or the person the text is about. So now we know what the possessive suffix in this function does, but when, and so it does fit on the same scale because it fulfills the same functions. So it's rather, um, yeah, it's the second place. So proper names and then uh, the next level of accessibility will be demonstratives and possessive, possessive suffixes. But when looking at the frequency I mentioned earlier in the, the table, I already showed it very shortly. I will come back to it later. We can see that it's, it is used, but to a very limited extent in numbers of frequency. And if the possessive suffix is used, it fulfills the same function. And I couldn't really found, find any reason in my data on when to actually use it. It seems to be up to the speaker. Um, and when looking at the numbers, even compared to its direct counterpart, the demonstrative, it's very low in frequency. Like if you, my, my data set is rather big, but I found a total of 17 um, examples, which is quite interesting because it's very frequently mentioned that also in CellCoop, as in many other Uralic languages, the possessive suffix does play an important role in anaphoric reference tracking. And according to my data, this does not really hold true. So that I think that's quite interesting and it's quite different than um, the use in other Uralic languages. So Selco behaves a bit different there. But I also want to state that in other contexts, the suffix is used to mark definiteness. So if you take a broader look at definiteness, not only anaphoric reference checking, the suffix does play a role. So it's not um, wrong to mention it in, 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 in the description of definiteness. 
for example, when looking at immediate situational use, these terms are by Hawkins, um, when, for example, talking about time periods or also seasons, um, it's still quite frequently found that they are marked with the possessive suffix and also for these unique celestial bodies as the sun, they are still frequently marked in Saukup. So the possessive suffix is important to mark definiteness. It's just not that important for anaphoric reference tracking, according to my data. Um, yes, I think these are my sources and that's me. Thank you for your attention. Спасибо, Йозефина. Есть ли вопросы? I'm not as multilingual as Chris, so if you could stick to English or German, that would be nice. Uh, Alicia? Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask a couple of cl clarification questions because the that uh, your talk was so in <laughs> full of information and you were checking, changing the slides and I wanted- yeah, Sorry, I was- No, I mean, this is the other, <laughs> otherwise it's a very full, informative. So yeah, um, my question was, I had several questions. The, um, going from the end to the beginning, uh, when you sh showed this table, when you calculated the um, number of demonstratives and uh, no, uh, non third person possessive. No, it was at the, at the no, 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 at the very end of your presentation. It's the same, it, yeah, uh, but... it was like 17 um, cases only. I was wondering, uh, the what happened? How did you count those uses where you have both? You have you counted them in both lines, or I think I counted them, yeah, they are should appear in both. But this is, we are talking about like, I think from five examples, from my 17 total examples, five also had the demonstrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other question was, uh, you seem to have said that demonstrative only was impossible for animate reference only in the pronominal form what do you mean pronominal form um if we really wait i had this example so if we use it like as a determiner like modifying the nominal phrase then it can obviously also refer to humans and other animated yeah, like like that snake in this construction you cannot it, this the demonstrative will not be used if uh, this is an animate no, it can't be used if it's, if it's the snake or if like such a long human, then you would use the personal pronoun. If you have the, the distinction is between humans, because for humans, if you refer back to them pronominal, you would, would use the personal pronoun of the third person. Mm -hmm. It's like here it's used like the English it or the German s, like the neutral yeah, because in in Enids, in both Enids, this is uh, the third person singular pronoun is seldom used. It is seldom used as an anaphoric device, and usually a demonstrative would be used, like for in animates. But in Enids, you can use both animate and inanimate, and you refer to them just by demonstrative, and that's all. So in Sekub, you if you refer to a human, you as a in my text, when they use the demonstrative, yeah, I uh, no, the personal pronoun, the top. Yeah, yeah, yep. because that was like surprising for me because, well, yeah, I thought, uh, why well, is it different? And my last question was about when you say zero anaphora, uh, do you understand right that you count, uh, you consider as zero those which are marked by verbal morphology? I think. I translated this to English. In, in German, I would usually not call it that. I, I, I called them that because of the lack of a better word. Maybe I should just write verbal agreement or something. Mm -hmm. So when you call it zero, it's all verbal agreement. Yes, yes, ah, yes. Because yes. You can, one can imagine real zero. Like no, no, it is. 
just not expressed on a nom like yeah nom yeah because like this is not level. very common but it still happens like in anets that you can have a subject conjugation but the direct object will be zero like uh it's not marked on the verb. Usually it would be marked on the verb if it's not uh, expressed by a separate noun phrase, but there are sentences and they're not, well, maybe 10%, so it's not 1%. Uh, this is possible to have this real zero, no verbal morphology. But, and no no, I, I mean, like like I had here that yeah, it's, yeah. Still okay. quite it's still quite clearly marked on the verb, but uh, the personal pronoun or the proper name or whatever is not repeated as one would need to do in, in German or English quite more frequently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. That were all my questions. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, Nicolette? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much also for the talk. And I have only one short question. That, do you have any impression of the, so whether in circle, the non-third non person singular possessive suffixes can also be used as as anatomic uh, non possessive markers? No, I didn't find any occurrences of that in mm -hmm. our data. I know that sometimes the second person is mentioned, but I couldn't really find any examples of that in our data mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. all the non possessive users. So I only found the possessive third person singular which is ah. also different than for the other Samoyedic languages. Yes, 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 that's where I was. Then, yes. okay. Ah, thank you. Спасибо. Да, Ольга Анатольевна. Thank you. Well, I just uh, wanted uh, to say that in Northern Selkup texts, um, primarily in old texts recorded by Prokofiev, uh, there are cases of the use of anaphoric use of uh, mm, demonstratives and not personal pronouns uh, talking of persons. Mm -hmm. uh, anaphoric use, Tentena, for example, Tentena said or Tentena did this or that, the Selkup Tentena uh, and not Tip. There are quite a few uh, Mm, personal pronouns, uh, third uh, person singular in those texts, mostly um, uh, mostly demonstratives. Okay, that's interesting. I will have a look at those texts then. I to talk u Prokofieva ili jest jeszcze u Varkovitskoj takie primeri? U Varkovitskoj jest. To je jest. No, what was now no matter of no go Prokofiev, mostly in Prokofiev's texts. Spasiba. Thank you. Masha? Do the present day Northern Selkups use Tentena for humans? Yeah. So now, now they use it also. Uh, there are, but not many. Many places. Many. Mm -hmm. So not only in the in all texts. Not only, but uh, quite uh, rarely. So there was a switch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so, but I didn't look at that attentively. Mm -hmm. I should do it. That wasn't a question for me, I guess, because so it was just a discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Yes, Linet. Thank you, Spasiba, Josefina. Du musst noch dein Bildschirm. Ja, ich versuche es gerade. Ich habe irgendwie die Freigabe. Mhm. Es geschafft. Следующий доклад Николет Муж и Каталин Мади. Я думаю, это будет говорить Николет. Да, спасибо. Спасибо. So I will share share my screen and 
or not? Did anything happen? Mm -mm. No. Oh my God. <laughs> but all of the all of this panel disappeared for me. <laughs> for some reason. Ah, right now. Is mm -hmm. it okay? Is it visible? And yes. is it large enough to, or should I en enlarge it? It is okay. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much. So yes, as, as Bea told, uh, I will present the joint talk and the, the results of, a, of a, an ongoing joint research that we have taken together with Scotty Maddy, who is also here and she is ready for answering your questions if you have any, and if it then concerns the prosody of the integrative constructions in Tundranya. Yes. So this talk is mainly about uh, some syntactic observations and generalization that we have made on the Tundranya genuine single con uh, content questions and also uh, some prosodic characteristics that we have observed on our data. So we will focus on in this talk on the possible word order that can be attested in the WH question and also the positions, syntactic positions that can uh, that are occupied or might be occupied by the uh, WH phrase in the single question. And also we will talk about the prosody and the accentuation patterns uh, observable in the uh, clothes. And uh, at the end of the talk, I will just really briefly mention some information and structural restrictions that have some uh, effect on the on the syntactic uh, structure of the of the sentence. Our main aim is to, to somehow figure out <laughs> whether there is a WH movement, which is a really huge uh, work and huge debate in the literature of the Tundranya. So we would like to know whether there is a WH movement or there isn't a WH movement. So uh, whether we can figure out something and, or anything about the syntax of the WH question and um, whether there is a dedicated position for WH phrase in the question. And as you will see at the end, by the end of the talk that, that we cannot properly and exhaustively answer this uh, question, especially for now, <laughs> we cannot answer it, but our results and, and the further questions that, the, that our results revealed can bring us uh, a bit closer to the to the final solution. So this background is just only about our methods. So we, we set up some some tests uh, containing uh, elicitation uh, tests, different uh, methods we have used for the syntactic research, research and uh, we use the results of these tests for setting up a, a reading aloud test. So the prosody is on the base, basis of the this reading aloud uh, test that have some or that has some consequences that we will reveal later on the talk. So we re recorded the sentences and and examined uh, them. Uh, we only cons consulted one not native speaker because we only wanted to to check whether our hypothesis can be uh, proved or not but uh, we would like to to extend this study so this is this can be only regarded as a pilot study that we uh, use for formulating our further hypothesis and set up our further tests for for a, a, a future field work or for, for future field work so let's see what what can we know about the syntax of the of the wh questions so uh, uh, this is the basic typological observation so Cross linguistically, there are two patterns that can be observed in or with respect to the uh, closer position of the W of the WH phrase in the WH question. Uh, there are many uh, languages in which the WH phrase is uh, fronted. So uh, it, this strategy is most likely available in the European languages, like in English, it is exemplified in BAN. So what did Peter buy the, the WH phrase, which is indicated in bold case characters in the talk. So this occupies the sentence initial position. And the other, other cross-linguistically observable uh, strategies when the WH phrase remains in situ, uh, it is 
highly or mostly available in the Asian languages, in the, uh, chi so spoken in Asia, uh, Chinese, Japanese, and uh, also the Amerindian languages exhibit this uh, strategy. And we also know that the Uralic languages, or most of the, or many of the Uralic languages also exhibit this strategy. This means that the question word does not, uh, question word does not move to any uh, position, but it occupies the, the position in the sentence in which um, the, the phrase which is not, which is substituted by the question word would otherwise appear. So this this uh, example is basically uh, similar to the to the English uh, example, but the Kriya Fang, sorry for the the uh, my pronunciation by. So uh, as you can see, uh, the object, the direct object follows the verb. So it exhibits an SEO uh, construction. Uh, if you take a closer look uh, or a detailed, more detailed look to the to the uh, standard typology, we can figure out that this uh, classification is, however, not really not really uh, uh, useful. I mean, uh, in the sense that it does not explain uh, every pattern attested overall in the languages, because there are uh, because there are languages, for instance, the Hungarian language, in which neither of the strategies uh, mentioned above uh, is available. But uh, so it is neither the question word is neither fronted nor it remain, remains it in C2, but there is an internal uh, WH movement in the question. So uh, a famous uh, example is Hungarian, in which uh, there is uh, there are two at least two uh, configurations uh, exemplified here. So in 3A, you can see Tegma Peter Mitvest, Mit is the question word, uh, is a direct object, Tegma Mitvest Peter. Uh, again, the question word, and if we, if we take a, a closer look to this to this pattern, we can see that that the position of the question word is immediately before, before the verb. So it it, it uh, moves the verb left adjacent position to the verb. So we can refine a bit this uh, uh, typology and and uh, say that the WH phrase either moves to a dedicated position or it remains in situ. It is uh, worth to be noted, however, that there are languages in, in which uh, both of the uh, or all of these uh, strategies are uh, available. The famous again, the famous thing, example is French, in which there there are question words which which are uh, fronted, but the, they can also be remain in situ. And uh, it is also interesting that uh, there are languages in which uh, the, the, uh, there are certain WH phrases that obligatorily move and certain WH phrases that obligatorily remain in situ. So there is a huge mix in, the, in, in these uh, patterns or strategies. So what do we know from, uh, about Sundrenyanyat and uh, from the literature? Uh, it is really famously Noun and emphasize that in Tundanyanya the WH phrase usually remains in situ. It is exemplified in four and five. Four, in four, it is the subject that is substituted by a WH phrase and it occupies the sentence initial position or a position in which it precedes the, both the ob object and the verb. And in five, it is the object, the direct object that is substituted by a, a, a interrogative verb. But and it occupies the uh, position before the verb, but after the subject. So both of the uh, constructions uh, exhibit or show an SOV configuration. It is also known from the literature that, that other uh, configurations are also available in the language uh, in which the, the question word can uh, occupy a, a position in which it is closer to the verb, or it can also, uh, move to another or at least uh, appear in a position in which uh, it precedes the subject. So therefore we thought that the first step is to refine uh, these uh, observations and say that it is, uh, so it is theorized that the, the question words or WH phrases can uh, appear either in situ or ex situ, but it's a bit too weak uh, for uh, instance and for especially uh, WH the junk. 
And especially because we do not know whether these adjuncts uh, have, a, have a position, structural position in the, in the sentence, and therefore we can have such kind of configurations that are really, uh, illustrated in 8, 9, and 10, in which the question word Kiaha, which means pen, occupies the sentence initial position. So when does the child go to school? Uh, uh, in nine, it occupies the position in which it, it uh, follows the, directly follows the, the uh, subject, but precedes the, the, another adjunct. And there is also a position in which uh, it uh, occupies a preverb position. Therefore, therefore, we thought that it is more appropriate to say that, that the positions that are available uh, for the Sundrenyanyat question words are the initial, the media, and the preverbal positions. Under these, uh, if, if you would like to define these positions, we can say that the initial position is either the leftmost position in the sentence, or it is the position before the subject. The media position is, some, uh, is a position between the subject and the direct object, or the indirect object, whether we assume that there is a structural position for the indirect object. And uh, also uh, the preverbal position is the position in which it is, it is immediately and directly adjacent to the verb. So that, that, that's about the syntactic part. And we can have several uh, possible explanations for these patterns that we have observed. One of them is that when we stipulate a, a, a WH movement in the question, like uh, the, the scenes in under 11, 12, and 13. So in 11, we can we can assume that that this uh, uh, question word that is closer right now to the verb uh, um, originally occupy the the sentence initial uh, position, and uh, there was a there was a question uh, word movement in the sentence, and therefore it ended up in this position. Similarly, in 12, we can also, also uh, um, assume that this question word is, uh, that occupies a different position. It is really important to mention that in these cases, we have to assume an, a further movement, but I don't, didn't want to, to uh, show these because it would make unnecessarily different, uh, difficult to understand and, and it, it was not really <laughs> the point of our, our talk right now. So, and also in 13, we can even uh, assume a, a WH movement in the case when it, it's seemingly uh, an in situ position and say that there is a, an initial uh, position from the, to which uh, it moves from this position. But there is also another explanation that the, the, the sentences uh, are marked informational structurally and the informational structurally uh, marked uh, elements in the, in the sentence uh, or constituents in the, in the sentence have dedicated positions and they, they uh, uh, occupy or they ended up in those uh, dedicated positions. So for instance, in 14, we can assume that this, uh, OSD configuration resides uh, because the direct object moves to a to, to topical position and the direct object is a topic. And uh, similarly, we can assume that this uh, does not occupy its uh, general position, but uh, it moves uh, further to the to the front to the left of the clause and there are also many other other uh, possible explanations to this syntactic explanation this, which we would like to or wanted to to uh, test and uh, prove and this is also uh, so we will get back to this later but we don't want to to uh, say that these are exclusively available for the so we don't have to choose between these strategies and and we didn't want to so we don't at the end of the of, of the talk we won't choose any of these strategies so we don't know still don't know the solution but we uh, see some some patterns so let's go to the prosody of the wh questions again a small uh, short typology in a nutshell so uh, cross linguistically there are two patterns that are available for the for the wh uh, phrases and the wh questions 
one of them is uh, when the WH question maintains the exactly the same accentuation pattern as the declarative clauses. Again, the European language is like doing this, uh, like English, German, Italian. They don't show any differences in their uh, accentuation. And again, there are languages in which the WH word receives the main accent, which is uh, usually similar to the, to the focus uh, constituent, and the other words are typically the, the accented. So we, or especially Kati, uh, investigated our data. So uh, we will show. So, uh, if you if you are interested in, you can find some samples and annotations uh, of these uh, sentences in this uh, link. But, uh, and uh, so during our prosodic research, uh, we investigated the the patterns with the three different uh, word orders. And what we have found is uh, kind of interesting and raises uh, more uh, questions. So in the case of, of an initial WH phrase, we have found that all words carry a pitch accent and there are over a falling intonation contour in the, on the word. Uh, in the case of a, of a medial WH phrase, the WH uh, word has a strong prominence. And uh, interestingly, the other words are de-accented, or at least they have a much weaker prominence than the WH word. And the preverb position is, is uh, similar in the sense that uh, the WH word is the only one that has a strong prominence and the other words are uh, again the accented or heavy prominence comparing to the to the WH word. So the overall pattern that we have found is that the WH word uh, received word received prominence in all of the cases, but it is only the the initial uh, position in which there is no de-accentuation of the, of the other word. So uh, the, if the WH word is uh, non-initial, then there is a de-accentuation. And uh, we have started to, <laughs> to try to ex uh, explain these patterns and find uh, some, some reason and explanation for this. So one, one possible explanation of this of this observation can be or of this pattern that, that, that is exhibited by the Tungreninet data is that uh, the, the positions that is that are other than the initial position are marked syntactically. So it might be that the, the word order in which the WH word is initial is the default unmarked uh, syntactic structure, and therefore uh, we don't find this the uh, accentuation pattern. And uh, in this case, there is no need to to mark the WH word with an extra special prominence. And uh, the other word orders are are marked, and therefore we need to accent the WH word. Uh, and there is also another. Uh, uh, explanation, which comes from the from the test task that we have undertaken and the test side that this reading side that uh, uh, the accentuation of the non initial initial words in a, is an artifact of reading and it can be that uh, dismissing the the accentuation is uh, of the, so the <laughs> missing of the, the accentuation is uh, observed in uh, context with uh, read spe speech and so it can be that this is the case or this is the real cause of these patterns that we have observed uh, there there were another interesting thing that revealed our uh, our test uh, which was about the stress patterns overall stress placement or patterns in in uh, wh word so uh, it is also known that the, the, the language is uh, uh, said to have third initial stress, uh, which is uh, observed or observable in the case of the question word Kiaha, which has a falling intonational contour and, the and its first syllable is uh, stress. But interestingly, the, every other WH word um, show another uh, other pattern in which uh, the second uh, syllable gets the peak 
and the right so and they show exhibit the rising pitch contour so this would indicate that there is a stress and prominence on the second syllable, not only not on the uh, not, uh, on the initial syllable. And the the question that that comes from or arises from this pattern is whether it is something that we have to have to investigate usually uh, in general in the in the Puntlany network stress patterns. Or it is something that the that the only the WH words show. So whether the WH words has has the second syllable uh, press, or or whether there is something to do with the with the uh, first press patterns overall or in general. And finally, uh, we wanted to really quickly uh, uh, investigate. The, infor the the in syntax and the information structure inter interface because the literature suggests that these different orders so this initial medial and preverbal orders may represent different in uh, different pragmatic interpretations but it is not necessarily necessarily the case and and uh, the image so these three positions may uh, have or reflect three variations so we wanted to test whether we can find any any uh, syntactic restrictions or not, and uh, so therefore we we tested these positions in non-neutral uh, informational structure in non-neutral sentences, and we combined the uh, WH phrases with focus and and topic uh, constituents. So what, what do we know in about uh, the focus constituents in general? So there are languages that, that do not allow, uh, allow the insertion, insertion of, uh, of a focus in WH phrase. So uh, a focus cannot uh, appear together with the WH phrase, but Tundra uh, uh, does not belong to these kind of languages because it allows for a focus constitu constituent in WH questions, but we have to uh, emphasize or note that it it is real, or it was uh, for the identification of Fossai, and we haven't tested it with information focus. And yeah, so I'm not pretty sure that they can uh, appear together. So luckily enough, in Tundra Nyanyas, there are morphological markers for the for the focus interpreters. So for the uh, that there are more morphological markers that ensure the focus in the interpretation. Uh, we use these three, three uh, morpho uh, morphemes uh, for the only focus, which is uh, the, called the limited suffix in earlier grammars, and this Hava for the even focus. But yet we have found here uh, is that in the case of uh, an insertion of an on only focus, the, both the initial and the media positions are uh, available. So the focus or the foci are. Uh, highlighted by blue color here. So as you can see, it is, it is a, gra a grammatical expression. So but the other configurations are, were not uh, accepted. And uh, uh, so the initial position was okay, but the medial and the, and the paper were not. And uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, either in the indirect object or a dative uh, argument, the initial and the media uh, position was also or were, were uh, also accepted, but not the preverbal. And we, we have found a similar pattern in the case of the even uh, focus. Um, the initial position was okay, but the preverbal not. But if we, if we just uh, take a deeper look or closer look to, to this pattern, we can state that uh, these uh, focus types cannot precede the WH phrase. So it is not uh, about the position of the WH phrase, but it, uh, this configuration is uh, results in a grammatical st uh, structure as long as the, the WH phrase precedes the, the uh, focus construction. Afterwards, we also investigated or, or examined uh, other operators because uh, we got the suspicion, suspicion that that uh, there can be uh, uh, generalized, that can, can be made a generalization, 
And we have found that the further occurrences, such as negative polarity items, for instance, uh, the one in 21, uh, 29, and uh, universal quantifiers or uh, phrases containing universal quantifiers indicate the same. Restri syntactic restrictions. So uh, this Husuvenyem cannot precede the 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 question word tibia, but the other other way around it would be acceptable and grammatical. So the possible explanations for this pattern could be that the, whether so either there is a WH movement, but it's a covered WH movement, so the WH phase only moves in the logical form, and these operators uh, cause an intervention effect, and therefore therefore uh, cannot be. Uh, Therefore, they result in a uh, ungrammatical construction. And the other other uh, possible explanation could be that the WH phase is really in situ, but it is linked together with the with the zero operator, which is higher in the in the uh, construction. And uh, these overt operators cause again an intervention between the link uh, between the the in situ WH phase and the uh, zero operator. But so far, we couldn't figure out how to test uh, and prove uh, these explanations. And uh, the other other uh, topic that we wanted to uh, discuss and, and also investigated is the insertion, insertion of, a, of a topic. But we weren't so lucky with the topic constructions or, or uh, topic phrases as we were with the, with the focus phrases in the sense that we, we are not pretty sure how to, to ensure topic interpretation for a, for a phrase because there aren't uh, morphological markers for, the, for uh, the topic. But we try to figure out some rules, some general rules that, that can more or less uh, help us. To, to get this topic interpretation. One of them is that uh, it is well known that the, the direct objects that trigger agreement on the verb uh, are topical objects, but it is also known that uh, they don't have a dedicated syntactic position even in the, in the declarative clauses. And what, what, what we have found here again, that these are orders are not invariant. So both orders are accepted and uh, due to the judgment of our speaker, they can mutually intelligible. Uh, we try to, to combine the WH uh, phrases. Also, the such phrases that, that share some typical characteristics with topics, these were the positive phrases and the DPs. And we have, we have found also the same patterns they can either precede or follow the uh, WH word. So again, the order is not invariant. So the topic phrases did not help us a lot, but otherwise they show something about the syntactic uh, construction of the, of the sentences. So a really quick uh, uh, summary of, of our talk or of our results that so as you have seen, there are these three positions available for the WH phrases, and uh, but our preliminary prosodic uh, investigations reveal that that uh, the WH phrase receives prominence in all of these uh, positions, but uh, there is a deaccentuation process that is only available with uh, non-initial WH phrase. And uh, the information, the combination of the information structure elements or uh, constituents with question words reveals that there might be some restrictions uh, in the in the syntax of the WH questions. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nicola. Any question? Uh, Paulina? Yes. Hi, Nicolette. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, so uh, actually, I'm very interested in that because uh, some time ago I've, did, uh, I've done some research on this. I was trying to test intervention effects in certain configurations in NANETS. And what I actually assumed all the time is that it is a WH in C2 language. So um, I'm not sure whether I got it correctly. Um, you don't assume this 
this is only one of the possible scenarios in your syntax, right? Yes. And could you could you explain to me again why you don't assume the WH and C2 for a tundra nanites? Because for all the questions that I've tested, the position of the WH phrase was in C2. So I didn't even think about uh, WH movement. And um, the, the configurations that I tested included uh, and only, but which is not phrasal, so not the re, mm -hmm. but uh, the Valkad, mm -hmm. which is not uh, which is not available in all dialects and all sub dialects, but only some. So in the Western dialects, I think it is available as only, and in um, and in the other ones, it means something else. So you have to be very careful. But in these configurations, I didn't have any intervention effects, mm -hmm. uh, which is very interesting because uh, our thesis, uh, well, our, our hypothesis we were testing was that, well, there are languages that don't show intervention effects in configurations where they should. So Nanitz would be a candidate for this. But for this story, it's very important that Nanitz is WH and C2. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that's why it's really important for me to see uh, why you're saying, you know, it might be WH movement after all. Yes. yes. So, okay. <laughs> Let's start at the, at the beginning. I was just checking the the my data, and unfortunately, I don't have such kind of here in which, for instance, it is the it is the uh, object that is questioned. And the the subject is uh, uh, focus constituent, and uh, this uh, configuration is also only available in in uh, which the WH word precedes the the uh, focus constituent. So an SOV configuration won't be acceptable, and. Uh, Simply the fact that that the only and the even fo focus cause this uh, intervention effect shows something about the syntax. So uh, I don't want to really uh, uh, state that there is a WH movement. So it can be that it is a WH indexing, but there is something in the syntax because otherwise, how would you? Explain uh, the ungrammaticality of the so, for instance, in 28, uh, or yeah, it's not a mm -hmm. good example because it's here. So, you know, the, 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 the ungrammaticality of these con configurations cannot be explained on the level of syntax, otherwise, that, that these uh, uh, operators could cause an inter intervention effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So uh, maybe we can exchange. It, sorry, <laughs> sorry, but might it be that, that this Malakada is not really a focus operator? So um, I was trying to be very careful with this, right? Mm -hmm. And I was, um, at some point I realized that um, some sub-dialects don't treat it as a focus uh -huh. intervener. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it doesn't have a meaning of only. But for those mm -hmm. um, sub dialects who did, well, it was just a couple of um, uh, informants at that point. I did test it and I didn't get mm -hmm. any intervention in configurations where you would expect it if you, you know, if you just assume a Ruthian analysis of mm -hmm. focus. So mm -hmm. you would get an intervention with a squiggle in these configurations, but I didn't. So I'm mm -hmm. happy to send you the handout that I have okay. for this. It's not published, uh, and I would be happy to have your handout. <laughs> and of course, maybe... I will send. So I can send you everything, and also the other data because we just selected. But yeah, so this twenty-nine. Do you see the, this? Uh, this basic uh, SOV configuration is is neither available, so it's not a. So it, it cannot be an in situ configuration. Yeah. Uh, yes. So so for my configurations, it was critical to uh, have you know, a word that is not mm -hmm. stuck onto something. Ah, um, mm -hmm. So that's why the re, um, I couldn't use the re for that. The mm -hmm. re mm -hmm. I treated as a phrasal only, but this doesn't allow me to create the configurations that I needed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I only could do it with Valkad so far. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I didn't get farther than that. So I didn't mm -hmm. test other possible interveners. Mm -hmm. So the data you have with every, uh, mm -hmm. is very interesting to me too, because- Yeah, I, I can send, send me yours as well. Yes, 
Yes, I <laughs> thank will. You. I'm, I'm happy to. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Chris? Yeah, basically it is partly a follow-up. So in um, examples 11 and 12, so um, if you could scroll up a bit, I think you used the um, focus phrase in the ritzy sense and so on, so that you have the structure there and you have the topic phrase, focus phrase and so on and so forth there, yeah? Yep. And, well, I I think, and, and basically I think you are too, I, I'm a bit afraid that this is leads to very non-economic patterns. So if we see, for example, in 11, in uh, example 12, if we see the focus phrase where the interrogative is in it, and then we have additionally two constituents, which also would have to move up in the structure even above the focus phrase. So I'm a bit of thinking that this is not the most economic solution if acknowledging the Ritzy model at all. So I'm quite well um, in the same, arguing in the same direction that I would not assume too much WH movement since, um, since I think the, um, the yeah, variation of the um, constructions can better be explained by movements of other constituents for topicalizing, backgrounding, and so on and so forth. I think this is the more felicitous um, option here, as you mentioned it as well. And for um, as for second, uh, my second short comment is that you um, was testing uh, um, topic, topic interventions in these kind of questions. And there I only want to say that I think um, the notion of topicality when understanding topics as um, the issue of talking, so the thing what the predication is about is kind of complicated in questions. So I'm not that surprised that you get not no clear results there. Yeah, thank you. So regarding your first comment, you are absolutely right. I just wanted to some so show that it is a logically possible explanation for for these configurations. And I, I don't want to say yeah, you were right. So there are there are many, many, many movements in this configuration since we, we get this order. So we have to move this one from the so yeah. And also a verb movement. So there are many, many, many uh, steps so far. We got this result, and therefore, uh, that you mentioned also, this economy uh, criteria wouldn't meet. And uh, but still, logically, it's a possible explanation. Like and uh, only therefore, I wanted to to show that it can be a movement. So we cannot exclude. Uh, uh, the mm -hmm. WH movement scenario, even when there is, there are many many reasons that that say that it is not a not a solution. But yeah, thank you. And otherwise, the topic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to how to to refine this test. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Gerson, Please. Is it is there is there still time? Uh, short question. What is how do you say then twenty one in Hungarian? Twenty one. Yes. When you say so, twenty one was a context in which uh, which is uh, not possible in Hungarian because here we have focus co-occurring with a wh phrase. Yeah, you are right. I was. I was I made a mistake because you can say it ki este meg az evest, uh, csak az iskolában. I have the I, I have the idea that this um that this test items. Mm -hmm. So um and later on you have word order operations which are possible with the test uh, the word order word order operations are not possible with the test item, but the test item is possible. So is this connection of only and even semantics and focus, is that the type of focus which uh, is uh, appropriate to test the co-occurrence of focus and, and WH phrases? This is what I'm asking myself. 
mm -hmm. on the base of these examples? I think uh, so. They are. I use these elements for testing intervention effects and everything that has a scope potentially that, that can be used for this test. And I think these kind of uh, kind of elements. So this only and even focus are also operators with, with uh, scopes, and mm -hmm. therefore they can be used. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I think yes, but you're right because yeah. So I, I so at least uh, in Hungarian the information and identification of foci are differentiated, and uh, they have different uh, features. Mm -hmm. And it can be that the so, for instance, the the information focus can cannot be iterated. So they can oh. only there can only be one uh, information focus. So mm -hmm. yeah, it might be that that it is the case only in, in uh, the case of Hungarian. So this. <laughs> There's there's one more ba background thing or foundation thing. Um, so not concerning the actual Nenet data, but. Uh, that was uh, in the beginning, that was, I think, example 16. That is when it's about the accent. So I was wondering, how can you see? So we, WH questions maintain the same accentuation pattern as declaratives. For example, English, German, Italian. But how can you see that? Because you, you change the word order. And mm -hmm. Peter, did, Peter bought bread. So now what I get, what did Peter buy? But this is not the same accent pattern. Mm -hmm. But it might be that the typology thinks that there what are- do you mean the last, the last item in the clause is, is, is stress bearing then? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, good, fine, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so the same- <laughs> Yeah, no pattern. explanation for it. <laughs> yeah. I got it. <laughs> so great, uh, thank you. Tapani here. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi. Sorry, hi. if there's still time left, I have a, just a couple of uh, questions about the data. Uh, if we go through the examples from 31 to 34. 31, 34. Yes. So I'm interested in where these examples uh, derive from, because as you can see yourself immediately, they they violate the basic morphotactics of the a language because you would say the interrogative forms would be namsada, <laughs> the exact mm -hmm. opposite of we find in these examples. So, so how did you collect or where did you get this mm -hmm. uh, data? Mm -hmm. With my informant. <laughs> but, but, but who, who and where? From where? Yeah. Okay. So, so as I mentioned, I, I worked together only with one uh, informant for this this thing. And um, so he's uh, Hadri, Hadri Okotesko. Yeah. And uh, he speaks the Yamal dialect. And, and we elucidated in a way that there was a, a basic declarative clause. And then we substituted the, the elements with interrogative phrases. And then we, we tried to create uh, object agreement clauses. And he provided this one. And it can be that my, my uh, so from the Russian Latin transcription is bad. There's no, this is not an issue about transcription at all. It's about the ah, basic, yeah, uh, structure of the word forms. Uh, and this would be the same. Uh, at least please somehow uh, add information about this being untypical, something that is not recorded from any other, or uh, there are no other records like this from, from of the language. Then maybe just a quick, Final question. Uh, let's check the example 24. Yeah. This is just a very minor question, but as you can see in 23, you have uh, glossed, this is just about glossing. <laughs> so you have the same interrogative uh, marker you have uh, correctly uh, glossed as interrogative, but then ah, it's passed. Mm -hmm. it, yes, yes, that's from, a mistake. Is there a point here? Is, is it just oh, no, lapse? No. No, 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 it's a mistake, sorry. Okay, it's sorry, just a lapse, but, okay. Yes, I yes, got yes, it. yes, 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 yes. It's a mistake because, yeah, you, all the time. Mark, okay, so, yeah. it's okay. Sorry, yeah, you are right. No problem. Yeah. No, okay, thank you and see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> thank you so much.
yeah, I have to stop sharing. Sorry. Thank you very much. Any other question or comments? Если нет, тогда могу закрыть сегодняшнюю секцию и обратить внимание на то, что завтра будут две секции – лингвистическая и этнографическая фольклористика. И завтра будет не, не вот этот линк – гамбургский, а томский. Правда, Лина? Да, я вот как раз, если… Меня хорошо слышно? Да. У меня какой-то отзыв. Раза у нас. Я попытаюсь расши, расшири, расширить экран. Можно? Угу. Вот это, это часть программы уже получили участники. Но я еще сделаю общую рассылку. И обратите внимание, завтра две ссылки. На лингвистической конференции одна с 14 до 16. Угу. А начиная с этнографии чайской. И дальше до самого конца это будет одна ссылка. Понятно. Если какие-то какие сложности, можно просто копировать ссылку из каждой секции вот слота. Угу. Если какие-то вопросы, вопросы пишите, пишите. У меня будет открыт имейл-конференция. У меня все. Хорошо. Тогда спасибо большое за доклады и за присутствие. И мы встретимся тогда завтра. Спасибо. Спасибо. До завтра. До завтра, до встречи. Да, привет. Ну, было понятно, у меня почему-то был вот звук в наушниках. Было понятно, что я говорю. Было два раза у нас, наверное, твой телефон и твой компьютер. Но слышно было нормально. Нормально было слышно, да. Да, да. Просто, просто у меня на что-то со звуком с компьютера. И с телефона я бы не смогла расширить, показать программу. Пришлось вот включить э, компьютер. Вот. Ну, большое спасибо за помощь. Ну, пожалуйста. Вот. Да, я тогда ä, при... хочу предоставить слово ä, Биате вакнер и Марии Быкиной ä, с их совместным докладом о повторении селькопских диалектов. Пожалуйста, мы... Очень рада вас слушать. Вам сказать через 15 минут, что осталось 5 минут? Да, пожалуйста, угу. скажи. Хорошо, давайте вперед. Угу. Значит, мы, мы с Беатой хотели еще раз посмотреть на форму, которая называется, начиная с очерков оптативом, форму L гласная, и у нее есть факультативный второй компонент, частицы или критика в разных диалектах. До этого эту форму называли будущим временем, императивом, отхортативом, будущим временем, императивом и многими другими словами до этого в исследованиях. Этой форме посвящена статья Надежды Генина Кузнецовой, 
и она отмечает две тенденции. Значит, эта форма очень по-разному употребляется в разных диалектах. С одной стороны, в, тымских, в тымском диалекте и северно-обских говорах эта форма используется в качестве показателя будущего времени и императива, а с другой стороны, в кетском диалекте она дрифурит в сторону императива первого лица. Пытались разные люди выделить общее значение этой формы. Вот Надежда Геневна, описывая ее, говорит о том, что она выражает реальное желание в сочетании с отнесенностью действия к будущему. Валя Гусев, сравнивая эту форму селькубского оптатива с Тандасанским дубитивом, предполагает существование общего просмодийского наклонения на L-гласную с первоначальным значением неуверенности и неутверждения истинности предиката, который относится к будущему времени. И в Сельпубском это значение может быть P, трансформировалось хорошо бы P, то есть добавилась такая коннотация желательности. В Магнасанском все случилось наоборот. Вот. И наши задачи данной работы были в том, чтобы уточнить распределение вот этих выделенных тенденций дрейфа этой, этой формы в сторону императива будущего времени по диалектным группам, посмотреть, насколько далеко зашли эти императивные значения и значения будущего времени, насколько они вытесняют другие формы, потому что императив во всех диалектах есть, императив второго и третьего лица формы есть. И чуть больше внимания уделить дистрибуции второго компонента. В первую очередь мы опирались на корпус, который сейчас делается в Гамбурге по текстам из архива томской исследовательницы, исследовательницы Ангелины Ивановны Кузьминой. Не очень, не, не очень большой, с одной стороны, корпус, с другой стороны, представлены данные по всем диалектам, собраны в короткие 15 относительно короткие 15 лет, меньше всего данных по центральным диалектам, но при этом, если мы посмотрим на частотность этой формы по диалектам, сразу бросается в глаза, конечно, что вот в центральных среднеобских говорах частотность этой формы гораздо выше, чем, чем на севере или в кетских диалектах. Также мы привлекали материалы из опубликованных сборников аннотированных фольклорных и бытовых текстов обско енисейского языкового ареала, издаваемых в Томске регулярно, и материалы корпуса, который раньше был сделан в Гамбурге, по опубликованным текстам корпуса СНЦ. Коротко о сельпубских диалектах. Вот здесь у меня цветом отмечено те из них, которые представлены в архиве в архиве Кузьминой, и коротко скажу тоже, что диалекты, как минимум разных диалектных групп, не взаимопонимаемы, сильно отличается фонетика, между многим отличается фонология, базовая лексика, в том числе глаголы говорения, обозначения родственников, в сфере грамматики северные и кетские диалекты отличаются от остальных по показателю именного множественного числа, система падежей не сильно, но отличается, Показатели имперфектива разные. Два есть. Одна, скорее, в северном, кетском и реже использующая с центральных и южных. И второй совсем, совсем другой, наоборот, для центральных и южных. Вот. И система там тоже, тоже разная. И по влиянию русского языка тоже, на самом деле, директные группы сильно различаются. Северные наименее были подвержены, южные и центральные довольно сильно. Как выглядит этот показатель? Здесь выписаны только наиболее частотные его формы. И известно, конечно, хорошо, что парадигматически распределено, распределены разные формы показателя аламорфы. Это хорошо известно, но мы, у нас была идея посмотреть, не зависит ли это от носителей и не... не не зависит ли форма показателя от того, какому, какому значению, может быть, склоняется форма к императиву или к будущему времени. Но, забегая вперед, скажу, что ничего из этой затеи 
не получилось. Значение императива и вообще форма императива довольно часто не очень одинаковы в зависимости от того, в каком лице и числе стоит глагольная форма. Поэтому для начала давайте посмотрим, в каких лицах чаще всего используется эта форма в разных диалектах. И здесь мы видим сразу большую вариативность в центральных много третьего лица, на юге скорее там, второе лицо, в кетских говорах практически исключительно первое лицо. Теперь мы посмотрим значение этой формы по диалектам. Начнем с северных, они, конечно, очень хорошо описаны в очерках, все значения, но я их здесь упомяну. Рассматривать будем по очереди по лицам. Отдельно посмотрим на первое лицо единственное число, потом первое лицо до лица множественного числа, второе третье лицо. Значит, для первого лица единственного числа основное значение – это намерение или императив, перв, императив первого лица. Вот в примерах 1 и 2. «Давай я тебя привяжу», «привяжу-ка я». Иногда эта форма переводится с помощью «хочу», «я тоже хочу нырять в воду», но, по-видимому, это такая внутренняя, что-то типа внутренней речи «нырну-ка я в воду». Несколько раз такие переводы с глаголом «хотеть» встретились. Также эта форма встречается в вопросах с будущим временем. В примере 3 «как я, пой как я, пой как я пойду», «как мне пойти». Как нам подсказал Вали Гусев, который нам помогал немного разобраться в этих значениях, за что ему большое спасибо. Это нормальное употребление императива первого лица. И, по-видимому, сюда же можно отнести запросы на разрешение, которые в очерках переводятся как «в дом можно войти?» «Я войду». И эта же форма употребляется именно в первом лице единственного числа в конструкциях с условием во второй части, вследствие из условия. Если я забыл что-то, заново еще расскажу. Расскажу-ка я это. Теперь перейдем к первому лицу множественного числа. Инклюзивный, основное значение – это инклюзивный императив первого лица. Соответствует русскому «давай». Давайте чум поставим. Давай пойдем в тот дом. Но встречаются примеры, которые... Трудно свести к этому значению. Вот пример 8 из нарративного текста, где говорящий рассказывает о, о том, как они заготавливали дрова, у них ничего не получилось. И он говорит, ну, мы поедем в другое место заготовлять дрова. Возможно, это передача собственной внутренней речи тоже. Или... Вот второй пример здесь без, без Селькубского. Чум с мы вверх поедем к людям. По контексту это муж говорит жене. В общем, это не то, что он ей предлагает, а скорее сообщает, сообщает о планах. Поэтому, возможно, это все-таки немножко другое значение, чем императив первого лица. Перейдем теперь ко второму лицу. Все примеры, которые встретились в корпусе, это императив будущего времени. Стандартная ситуация, когда кто-то, умирая, оставляет наказ, инструкции того, как, тому, как слушающему надо себя вести в будущем. Может переводиться на русский язык будущим временем. Медведь умирает, так сказал. Маркынчик, когда-нибудь ты меня вспомнишь. Но чаще переводится все-таки императивом на русский язык. Что старшая дочь скажет потом, когда-то. Ты ее слушай. В третьем лице в северных диалектах эта форма тоже употребляется. И э, тоже э, в качестве императива будущего времени. Э, пусть, э, пусть, пусть, пусть они вдвоем туда пойдут. Потом, после того, как что-то случится. Но вот э, один пример, который не удается объяснить таким образом. Какое-то другое, может быть, здесь значение. Пример 12. Говорят, они потом пошлют. Они, они говорят, потом пошлют. Возможно, здесь передается исходная форма первого лица. То есть давайте мы потом пошлем. А вот они говорят, предлагают потом послать. 
И также эта форма в третьем лице используется в вопросах с будущим временем. Он ходит, думает, как, как он его схватив, потом возьмет. Насколько частотно разные значения можно увидеть на этой картинке. Много используется в знач... в эта форма в значении вот, намерения императива будущего времени в первом лице, но довольно много ее и во втором лице, в третьем, в третьем, в третьем лице реже. И, в общем, здесь в северном диалекте кажется, что трактовка этой формы как императива будущего времени вполне возможно и не противоречит, не противоречит данным. В записях Ангелины Ивановны для северного диалекта есть две, два ламорфа для этого показателя «ла» и «ля», и совершенно непонятно, как они распределены, пока это не так по носителям, по, по лицам, по значениям они не распределяются. Теперь, что касается вот второго компонента, частицы «са», она, видимо, тяготеет к препозиции, позиции встречается гораздо реже и используется почти исключительно во втором лице и почти обязательно во втором лице. Вот в этом значении собственного императива, императива будущего времени как по отношению к слушающему. И один раз она встретилась не с формой оптатива, а с обычным императивом третьего лица. Вот следующей ночью будет средний, средний брат, вот пусть он, пусть он спит тогда. И здесь тоже вот эта частица, частица са, то есть, видимо, ее функционирование не ограничено только формулой оптатива. Перейдем теперь к чешским диалектам. В работах Кузнецовой предлагается... Для кетских диалектов эту форму трактовать как адхортатив, то есть исключительный императив первого лица. И в материалах корпуса НЛ большинство примеров действительно про первое лицо. При этом не только «пойду-ка я» или «давайте мы вместе что-то сделаем» есть значение, но и вопросы к первому лицу. Что мне теперь, если медведь придет, там, что, мне, что мне делать? Или даже в, в предаточных он мне сказал, чтобы я делал, как знаю. Чтобы, чтобы я делал, оформлено автотивом. Два непонятных примера для кетских диалектов нам попалось. Оба, один, один из, из текста, где говорится про, про шаманское камлание, и второе – из песни, то есть из, из ненарративных, нефольклорных э, текстов. Э, в примере 17 мы видим шаман Камлайт и говорит нечто оленье, пусть прилетит. Форма, э, форма Туллей, я ее не совсем э, понимаю, честно говоря, вот э, пос, последний похож на императив третьего лица, э, но что тогда здесь делает показатель Ле, э, э, непонятно. И пример 18 из песни, где девушка ходит встречаться с любимым, а потом говорит, приду домой, меня ругают. Когда я прихожу домой, меня ругают. Значение явно не намерение, не, не императива по отношению к первому лицу. Вот такое, такое употребление тоже встретилось. При этом частица... Са в каком-либо варианте в кетских диалектах не, не зафиксировано, что, конечно, не значит, что ее нет. У нас корпус все-таки ограничен, все материалы, которые есть по, по кетскому, опубликованы. Может ли быть такое, что просто нам не попалось ни разу второе лицо? Я, я думаю, что да, и поэтому вот так однозначно называть адхортативом Наверное, нужно быть с этим аккуратнее, учитывая, что у нас нет отрицательных примеров совсем. И нет, к сожалению, уже возможности их получить. Маш, пять минут осталось. Да, спасибо. 
в центральных диалектах. Если мы посмотрим, здесь рыженьким на графике обозначены значения будущего времени. И у нас для центрального диалекта, в основном крымские и нарымские, не встретилось других показателей будущего времени, хотя она возможна. Что касается критики, то вот эта критика, которая имеет вид хе в центральных диалектах, она отсутствует в третьем лице, а в остальных встречах, в случаях скорее есть. Примеры я тогда пропущу, у меня осталось мало времени. Скажу, что вот, скажем, в Васюганском диалекте тоже эта форма используется только для будущего времени, в императиве используется другая форма. А в Нарымском диалекте, давайте посмотрим на пример, она используется точно и в императиве, и в будущем времени одновременно. Посмотрим четыре предложения из текста. Князь этого мальчика увидел и говорит, пошли с нами. Это императив первого лица. А мальчик отвечает, мать меня не отпустит. Она меня не отпустит, видимо, в будущее время, та же самая форма. Он у матери просит, отпусти, императив, с окончанием второго лица сингулярисом не императивным. Та же форма. И мать плачет, один блат твой уже потерялся, ты тоже потеряешься будущее время второго лица, но при этом мы видим здесь вот этот второй компонент, то есть получается, что у нас императив отличается, форма императива отличается от формы будущего времени наличием второго компонента. В южных диалектах, в среднеапских, этот показатель, наоборот, используется практически исключительно в императиве. При этом вот во втором, во втором лице императива, как и в центральных говорах, критики нет. В других случаях она может появляться, но вообще скорее распределена парадигматически. Примерно, наверное, тоже я эти пропущу. И обращусь к диалекту чая, от которого в корпусе есть данные довольно много от двух носителей. И интересным образом вот эту императивную форму использует один носитель чеинского диалекта, одна носительница, точнее, и совсем не использует а, другая. И почти не использует, почти не использует другая. И, а, простите, пожалуйста, я про средний диалект забыла сказать, что здесь уже форма императива на ле, вот этого оптатива, вытесняет а, основной императив и используется в разы чаще, чем основной императив. В чинском диалекте такого, такое происходит у одной носительницы, но совершенно не происходит у другой, которая скорее употребляет эту форму, схожую с кетскими диалектами, то есть в основном в качестве императива первого лица. Вот. Ну и в заключение хочется сказать, что, собственно, оптативного значения, как в примере «хоть бы он пришел», пожелание говорящего, которое он сам не контролирует, оно не встретилось ни разу, что не значит, что его не может быть, потому что само значение довольно редкое, но, к сожалению, спросить, спросить сложно. В северных диалектах значение похоже на императив будущего времени больше. По крайней мере, в некоторых диалектах центральная группа эта форма используется почти исключительно как показатель будущего времени. Как мы видели на примере чая, даже внутри одного диалекта могут быть и диалектные отличия в употреблении этой формы. И при наличии императивных и фактуральных значений у одного и того же носителя они могут дополнительно различаться использованием вот этого второго показателя критики. Хотя, конечно, императив, в принципе, скорее про, про, про второе лицо, а в будущее время про первое и третье чисто это не используется. Для корпуса у нас возникает вопрос, конечно, о том, как, как ее гласировать, в частности, в тех диалектах, где, в тех случаях, где действительно у говорящего есть и императивное употребление, и употребление в значении будущего времени. Но, видимо, видимо логичнее все-таки использовать для одной формы две разные голоса. Потому что какого-то общего, общего значения тут 
трудно выделить, на мой взгляд. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо большое, Маша и Пята. Очень большой информативно насыщенный доклад. Кто хочет задать вопрос? Вот Наташа Стойнова вроде подняла руку. Да? У меня пара наивных вопросов про семантику. Я хотела спросить вот про это значение вопроса. Я правильно уловила, что на самом деле там два таких близких подзначения. Одно вот запрос на разрешение, что вы назвали, да, типа можно войти, а другое скорее риторические вопросы, типа как мне войти, в смысле, что я не могу войти. Во-первых, верно ли это? А во-вторых, я правильно поняла, что вот запрос на разрешение, это бывает только для первого лица типа можно войти, а для третьего в вопросах это только а, вот такие риторические вопросы. То есть можно он войдет, не бывает, а бывает только, а, бывает только как же ему войти. И а, третье, правильно ли я а, поняла, что для второго лица такого представить себе совсем невозможно, что а, вот это вот риторическое, это где же тебе войти, вот такого совсем нигде ни в одном диалекте не бывает. Это так или не так? Значит, про э, риторический вопрос скорее так. Э, переводы типа «можно мне войти» э, на вопрос разрешения. Я вз... Мы взяли примеры из очерков э, в текстах. Mm -hmm. В текстах в текстах мы таких не встретились. Mm -hmm. И если я не ошибаюсь, в очерках есть примерно третье лицо тоже э, mm -hmm. э, в таком же в таком же значении. Ну, лучше, лучше проверить. И для второго лица не встретилось. Угу. То есть Больше. то, что есть в реальных текстах, это как раз риторические вопросы. Да. Но, может быть, потому что просто это частотнее контекст. Или нет? Но при этом они же могут и э, обычным будущим временем оформляться. Угу. Спасибо большое. Так я пойду. Герсон, пожалуйста, вопрос у тебя был. Спасибо, это был очень интересный доклад. Я только хочу сказать, что из перспективы камасинского языка я очень рад был, что название будет «Футур». Потому что в камасинском языке форма на «ла», «ле», он, ну, можно сказать, чистый, чистое будущее. Ну, конечно, будущее очень принятно, что будет из этого тоже модальнее значение. Вот, только да. мне. Спасибо. Мы тоже очень, очень рады, что будет будущее время, обтатив под вопросом пока. Может быть, если пока нет других вопросов, я могу маленький вопрос спросить. Вот в начале цитировалось Валино утверждение про, про, про самодейский ла как отсутствие утверждения, что такое отсутствие уверенности, да? да. Ваше, вы пред, предлагаете, что что вот на том самом начальном слайде было показано, что вот в сельхопском языке, видимо, из прасмадийского, можно предположить, развелось из неуверенности э, желание, какое-то аптеативное значение. Да? Вот вы хотите сказать, что те значения, которые вы нам сегодня показали, они развелись из аптативных, или аптативного, может быть, так и не было, а просто была неудачно названа эта форма э, или названа по какому-то одному диалекту, а в других такого оптативного значения и не было. Оптативное значение, судя по тому, что оно ни разу не встретилось, но оно редкое. Было ли оно где-то хорошо бы, чтобы П, но компонент желательности – мне кажется, что скорее, скорее нет. Может быть, если, 
Если бы вы разрешите, я просто предположу, что оптативом называли вообще довольно много всего. То есть, наверное, ваши взгляды имели в виду, что не встретилось в узко оптативом, в том, что именно называется оптатив, отличается от всего остального. Да, вот Хоть, учитывая, хоть... что оптативом называют и императив, и третье лицо, и еще много всего, вот, то вот. Я, я думаю, что это терминологическая а, проблема отсюда. Но все-таки называют, в смысле, есть центральное значение слова оптатив, а есть как бы не такие периферийные значения слова оптатив. И использовать слово оптатив, если имеются ввиду только периферийные значения, наверное, все-таки не очень адекватно. Mm -hmm. Хорошо, тогда я еще в дополнение, если вроде больше никто не спрашивает, спрошу, а как-то вы диахронически понимаете, как вот это значение в одних диалектах вы показываете императив, в других будущее, как они, ну как-то у вас есть предложение, как это было... Везде было в начале будущее, а потом из них императив, или вначале везде был императив, потом из них будущее, или изначально развивалось из... по отдельности. Хотя нет, был же, наверное, просит копский язык, так что должно быть какое-то общее значение. Для ответа надо было бы посмотреть исторические тексты. Мы пока до этого не дошли. Это один путь, который, по которому можно пойти и посмотреть исторически. Но а пока мы посмотрели вот это... Более ранние тексты. Ранние ну, тексты надо было бы угу. посмотреть. Но там есть некоторые проблемы. Например, донорские тексты до сих пор э, не опубликованы. И так далее. А переводы э, не знаю. Я не очень люблю эти переводы и по поводу переводов сказать что-то. Но это одна возможность, Олеся, посмотреть еще дальше. В общем, пока, мы серьезно, пока мы серьезно не задумывались о том о развитии, о развитии значения. Uh -huh. То есть пока нам было скорее интересно посмотреть, насколько в одном, в одном и диалекте может быть одновременно и в будущее время и императив. И вот, видимо, существует на рымский диалект, где это возможно, а другие все-таки выбирают какой-то один из путей развития этой формы. Uh -huh. При этом парадигматически во втором лице, я не успела сказать, почти всегда это ле. То есть оно формально ответ... во всех остальных лицах, кроме первого сингулярного объекта, где это тоже ле, это, это ла. А, то есть они а, различаются, может быть, они расходятся как-то немножко и по этому, или вот с помощью а, второго, а, второй части а, критики, критики С. А, они раз, разводятся внутри одного диалекта. Если я правильно помню, это последний доклад этой секции. Слово Кайсли Кахинен, который представит нам доклад Тангонасанский тоже. Кайсла. Видите мой экран? Да, да, видим. Хорошо, я буду читать. Меня зовут Кайсла Кахейнен, и сейчас работаю над, над диссертацией в университете Хельсинки об истории самодийских языков и субстрате на национальном языке. Сегодня я хотела бы говорить о иная тема, пока очень мало изучена в области финогристики. Тема сегодняшнего доклада – самоисправление на национальном языке и чрезвычайно показательные настроения 
uh, if it is disposed with such purchased way marker of preparative may cause um, yeah. uh, uh, Что такое самоисправление? Uh, самоисправление – это очень обычное явление устной речи, которое состоится в том, что говорящий сталкиваясь с какими-либо трудностями или ошибками в своей речи, прерывает актуализацию артикулацию текущего предложения и стремится исправлять проблемы и потом вернется к сообщению. В рамках интеракциональной лингвистики, когда говорим о проблемах или ошибках речи, мы не имеем в виду отклонения от норм стандартного или литературного языка, а то, что говорящие сами считают проблематичным или ожибочным в своем речи. Таким образом, обратим внимание на тех моментах или на тех частях текущего высказывания, которые вызывают презентации, паузы, исправления и так далее со стороны говорящего. С другими словами, подход к языку не нормативный, а мы смотрим язык с точки зрения его прагматических функций, функций то есть что говорящие делают языком и что они хотят достигать, какие являются цели взаимодействия. Самоисправление – это исправление, которое начинает сам говорящий ожибочного предложения. Здесь мы видим пример из гамбургского корпуса на масанской устной речи НСЛ, где говорящие сначала скажет, что случай, о котором речь идет, происходился утром, а потом она отмечает свою ошибку и прерывая текущие предложения, исправляет себе и с помощью отрицательной частицы «минду». Само исправление имеет различные прагматические функции. От решения проблем с физическим речепрождением до проблем с социальных отношениях между участниками разговора. В этом случае без... А, нет. Здесь мы видим пример так называемого ретроспективного типа. То есть исправление начинается после конкретной э, проблемы. Однако говорящие могут также э, предвосхищать проблемы, когда говорим о проактивном типе исправления здесь. Эм, в проактивном типе исправления говорящие начинают исправление в своей речи прежде, мы видим никакие проблемы. Может быть, что говорящие не помнят желаемое слово сразу и используют проактивные способы исправления, чтобы выиграть время думать. Или в этом наносанском примере путем повторения здесь сама молнда повторяется. Говорящие уклоняет слишком длинные паузы и стремится показывать, что он или она скоро найдет решение и будет продолжать предложение. Очень типичными, грамма, типичными грамматическими способами для проактивного самоисправления являются хезитация паузы, вопросительные конструкции и Препаративные подстановки, на которых мы сегодня будем сосредоточиться. Здесь мы видим пример 
препаративна подстановка – это лексем, который используется способом проактивного исправления, когда слово служит прагматические цели и повторяет свое семантическое значение. В языках мира препаративная подстановка используется, кроме другими, семантического обобщения слова, например, «веш» или «дело», как в армянском языке, следуя статьи «подлеспе» и вместо «не подлеспе». «Подлеспе» я, ну, мы будем смотреть сети. Но и вместо имени, как в русском языке, где в этом функции служится указательное настроение «это». Также в монасанском языке самым обычным словом в качестве препаративной подстановки является указательное настроение «эмпи» с значением «это». И здесь вы, вы видите um, пример из монасанского языка, где указательное настроение стоит вместо топонима «киристов» или «крестик», uh, который в этом предложении является атрибутом постпозиции «я» и склоняется в винительном падеже. Uh, в этом случае также препаративная подстановка «энты» получится постпозиции «я» и склоняется в том же uh, падеже um, uh, с всякими um, статьи. Um, например, вариациями или uh, аллогонами. Номинальная морфология с препаративной подстановкой типологично довольно обычная черта, которая фигурирует и в русском языке, в финском языке и многих других. Кроме того, монасанская препаративная подстановка имеет менее обыкновенные характеристики средней глаголная морфология. В монасанском место имени «эмпли» может в качестве препаративной подстановки носить и глаголные профиксы, а не только число и лица, или так называемые суффиксы «номен», «вербум», которые в самодействии языка используются на именно в существительных предикативных предложениях, как вы уже знаете. А, а эти примеры препаративная подстановка может принять и суффиксы инфинитива или модальности, которые в других контекстах фигурируют только с настоящими глаголами. И это типологично очень редко. В большинстве других языков мира само исправление этого типа требует настоящий глагол с препаративной подстановкой, например, «телат». И э, на русском языке я могу сказать, э, я делаю это, а, не, я, я этаю. Э, и даже на финском я не могла бы сказать вот так я, я, я мне надо было бы использовать деривативный суффикс но в монасонском ситуация иная и ам, надо обратить внимание к еще одной грамматической форме а, характерной для самодельских языков это деснятивное наклонение имен. Это наклонение имен имеет бенефактивное значение, например, что у нас состава, мату, для меня пришел олен. И обычно оно никогда не употребляется на место имена. Например, следуя лейсия, Никогда возможно сказать «амадама ту о» – это для меня пришел, или «силидама ту о» – то для меня пришел. А, напротив, 
что касается препаративной подстановки, это возможно, как видим из примеров Гамбургского корпуса. К сожалению, у меня нет транскрипции полностью. Там фигурируются такие примеры антирамы, маларамурому, где антирамы на месте этого слова и антирыча, колырыча. Значит, препаративная подстановка может получиться эти вот, маркеры дестинатива и единственном и множественном числе. И я думаю, что этот пример уже фигурируется а, здесь, кстати, под леская. А, в конечном счете мы отметим, а, как мне уже в 2019 году в Гамбурге в Финноугорской студенческой конференции сообщил Крис Тебриц, а, указывается, что одинаковое явление фигурирует и в долганском языке, и, как сказала мне Олеса Фанина, даже в Энецком. Может быть, что речь идет только о корреляции грамматического структура языка с прагматическими особенностями, потому что эм, это указано, что эм, эти грамматические особенности языка эм, коррелируют, коррелируют э, с прагматическими способами, которые э, говорящие используют. Но возможно и о реальном развитии феномена. Э, и поэтому я хотела бы слышать от вас. Э, Потому что я знаю, что здесь много специалистов различных э, самодельских языков и языков Сибири. Э, скажите, э, пожалуйста, когда доклад э, кончится, э, есть ли языки, вы изучаете такие э, необыкновенные э, прагматические явления? Э, э, я во, во всяком случае, э, еще хочу сказать, э, что прагматика самодельских языков требовала бы более длительное рассмотрение. Э, я уверена, что еще э, предстоит новое объяснить. Это все. Спасибо. Спасибо большое, Кайсла. Есть возможность задать вопросы. Я... Ну ладно, давайте вначале вы задайте, потом я спрошу. Маша, пожалуйста. Да, спасибо большое за доклад. Я хотела узнать, правильно ли вы, правильно ли я поняла, что вы считаете, что анты, который placeholder, и МТ, которые указать на местоимение, собственно, это какие-то родственные вещи или даже одно и то же? А, извините, я не очень <laughs> понимала. И, и, я, вы, вы можете также э, спрашивать на английском, потому что... Для меня трудно спонтанно говорить. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there are two stems, MT with M, uh, with M and NT, NT with um, M. Uh, do you think it's uh, they're somehow related or it's just one stem? I How assumed that they are versions of the same stem because in this 
uh, the, the dictionary Kosterkina is Anovai Monde, um, there is only Anti. I, 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 I just assumed that Anti and Andi are variations of the same stem, and actually, at least Anti and Andi are, um, they are, let's see, gradation, they, they are just gradation forms, so it, it agrees completely with all the gradation patterns. Because as, as far as, as I know, empty is used as demonstrative pronoun and empty uh, only as a plus placeholder. So there seems to be two stems, or am I wrong? Okay, I would, I would need to check that one. But I think that uh, empty doesn't, I, I haven't seen it take any case form. So always when it's in, in any case form, but the nominative, then it's and the or but yeah that might be uh, it's just that the undi or unti does not um it does not appear in the dictionary mm -hmm. which is why i assumed it's non nominative thank you uh chris uh yeah so so maybe, maybe i should also um talk in English, yeah, I would um, contribute to the aerial discussion, if it is an aerial discussion or not. So from a Dolgen point of view, yes, you're correctly right, but um, there is a similar phenomenon and um, which works quite similarly. However, there are two little details um, which are different, which might also be important. On the one hand, um, it is not a demonstrative pronoun used in Dolgen, but an interrogative pronoun. This on the one hand, and on the other hand, in verbal contexts, there is the need of a verbalizer at the end of the pronoun. So you get the interrogative pronoun, verbalizer, and then all the verbal morphology there afterwards. So, so um, basically similar structures, but somehow um, formally differently. Mm -hmm. Additionally, um, as far as I can say, in Evanky, there's a similar phenomenon there is also interrogative pronoun used as in placeholding function. And there it resembles more than Ganasan pattern. So there we do not need a verbalizer if I'm not completely mm -hmm. ad hoc. Okay, that's um, interesting. Thank you. Because um, in, uh, at least in, in Finnish, I could use a similar uh, structure with a verbalizer uh, that is grammatically possible, but I would never do it since it sounds strange. So that might be the aerial aspect that it, it is used. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I have um, a friend who is um, a native speaker of uh, Saha, mm -hmm. and she at least does not recognize such a phenomenon when I showed her these Dolgan examples, but it might just be because people usually do not recognize pragmatical phenomenons even in their own native language so yeah. i left it out of the presentation but at mm -hmm. least yeah if i might very shortly reply to this this might might also be because um in dolgan it is the animate interrogative kim who and in sacha it is rather if it is used it is rather the inanimate what what so this might also be a reason why mm. she did not recognize it yeah thank you Uh, Natasha? Mm. I think uh, this is just a uh, uh, short follow-up to Chris. Uh, mm, uh, I wanted to mention uh, also uh, these uh, Tungusic um, interrogative pronouns uh, in the placeholder uh, function. Uh, this is very uh, widespread, not uh, only in Evanke, but also in other uh, Tungusic languages. and. Uh, I just wanted to mention um, papers uh, by uh, Elena Klitschko. Um, maybe it would be interesting on uh, these uh, interrogative uh, pronouns in, with nominal and with verbal morphology uh, in the placeholder function in different Tungusic languages. Uh, Elena Klitschko. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted just to add 
um, first a very general comment that if we to speak about an aerial phenomenon, we first of all would need information about Nenets and Yakut. Kind of if you if you can show that these languages are related but are spoken in a different area, and then they have it or they don't have it, that could be a diagnostic test. And maybe we can. I don't know about minutes, but maybe we can immediately ask Rosa <laughs> whether this kind of uh, placeholder uh, stem exists and is used in uh, minutes. Sorry. Да, Роза, я э, хотела спросить, что э, в ненецком языке вот такое слово заместительный э, ос, корень э, есть, который используется и с именной, и с глагольной морфологией. Mm, well, when I listened to this uh, presentation, thank you so much for your presentation. I was also thinking about this possible um, parallels also in the Nenets language. And then I didn't uh, actually pay so much attention to it, but I remember that uh, sometimes people they use the Russian at a summer just to correct themselves. So, and uh, on the Nenets example, well, I, I, I'm not sure, I need to check, but because I worked for a long time on collecting this oral history narratives from the Nenets people, I should have them, but uh, somehow I never paid. So I, I remember that people, they, they use this at the summer just to correct themselves and so forth. But it was Russian boring, I think. Yeah, that's uh, actually very interesting. Rosa, and what about uh, the word my? Uh, Tandra Nenets uh, word, my. Uh, my. Yeah, yes, it could be, but... Uh, yeah, but uh, do you think that it could have the same function like uh, at the summer? It may be probably, yeah. I think people, they use it a lot, especially in the tundra. Masha, do you want to say that you think that me is used in this function? I'm not sure about uh, the exact this function, um, but it should be studied, I suppose, uh, maybe somehow to research it. <laughs> yes, the, the phenomenon is, um, so it, it appears, or, or the self-correction is so universal that if we take any um, longer excerpt from a normal conversation, we should find examples. Uh, yes, uh, what I wanted to add. Now, I, I, I wanted to add about Enid's data, that it's a little bit, a little bit different in the in the uh, sense that this stem, which is mu in Enid, it is not a pronoun. It's not a demonstrative pronoun mm -hmm. and not an interrogative pronoun. But if, uh, as Masha suggested in the beginning, if in Ganasan there are also two different stems, then the situation would be like in the same in Enid and Ganasan. But if this is actually in Ganasan the same stem as a demonstrative pronoun, then the situation would be different um, for uh, Enets. It is definitely not the same stem. Not the same. Yeah. No, definitely not. Mm. Mm. Um, yes, and there are also other stems that are used, but um, these ones are the most frequent. So it is a, a much wider phenomenon pragmatically than just this one stem, but mm -hmm. it, it, I couldn't handle it all in presentation. Yeah, because in Enets, it is this move with the nominal or verbal morphology is omnipresent. It's everywhere. I mean, you, it's not like in Enets when, when Masha or Rosa are unsure, maybe not. Like, I have no doubts that it is used a lot and it is used as a placeholder. So, but maybe this is then 
quite a unique feature of Enets and Ganasan that developed it in contact. Um, yeah. Chris wants to add something? Yeah, not, not really to add, but rather to ask. So since um, since in Dorgan we have also um, a similar item which is used after after its copy, so to say, and it has the then the basic meaning and so on. So like in I I went hunting and so on, and then you have the verb to hunt with verbal morphology and this other placeholder verb with verbal morphology and so on. Are there any similar constructions in Samantiatic? In in my um, my study, I didn't find any. So there is some with ma, but it I I think it does not take verbal morphology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's like this in any. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Natasha, do you want to ask something or is it just a raised hand from your previous question? Then do we have any final remarks, final questions? Uh, последний небольшой вопрос или комментарий. Then maybe I close this session, uh, which has given me a lot of <laughs> positive emotions. It was very nice to listen to four talks in a row uh, devoted uh, all about this Samyadic language. As our main language, I came to English, maybe we can speak it in Russian. Thank you very much. I'm happy to end this section, in which there were four interesting talks. И теперь а, мы а, прерываемся на час, насколько я понимаю, и после этого у нас будет последняя сегодняшняя секция с тремя другими не менее увлекательными докладами, а, как наверняка а, окажется. Спасибо всем большое а, и до встречи через час. Mm -hmm.